Good morning. Good morning. There's a verse in Ephesians that said, To him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly um, above all that which we could ask or think through the power that is within us. To say, I even imagined or even thought about being here, I cannot say. So this is more than I have ever imagined or ever asked for. I thank your pastor for allowing me to come and to especially stand here on this day which I know Mother's Day is special to all churches and a lot of them want to hear their own pastor. So I thank him for this opportunity. I thank Brian, as he said, my friend, and for recommending me. Because I'm just thrilled about that. Because Brian does every every Monday morning. I come in a little later than everybody else (laughs) here. But I, I'm always waiting for Brian because when I hit the door, Brian gives me a big hug. And sometimes when you age and you're in a place where the kids are old en- are young enough, not old enough, they're young enough to be your children and your grandchildren, you're a little intimidated. But when I see Brian, it kind of all goes away. I'd like to thank you, the congregation, for allowing me to come and, and speak before you today. I thank the people who came with me, my family. We all stand, if y'all don't mind. Can they stand? Those are my husband, my children, my sister-in-law, in-laws, and that's about it. But, (laughs) now that man that stood up, that's my husband. He's mine. (laughs) Okay. My scripture was Mark 5.24, when all else fails. And since it has already been read, I would not prolong the time in reading it again, if that is okay, Pastor. Okay. Have you ever received a gadget or a child received a toy that you had to put together? You try everything you know to do, and still it doesn't work. You exhaust many man hours, You are to the point of frustration. Nerves are running out of control. Everything you have done has been wrong, and it failed. But then you remember, read the directions. You see, in our text today, we are not dealing with a woman who is dealing with a gadget or a new appliance or a toy. But she is dealing with an issue of her health. And in verse 24, the scenes open where there's a large crowd following Jesus. And they're pressing in on him. See, Jesus is on his way to heal Jairus' daughter, who is about to die. So he is in the process of going to Jairus' home. And the crowd. It's with them. You know, everywhere Jesus went, there was a crowd. There were some who came for healing. There were some, probably like today, just came to see what was going on. There were some who came for the food he had given. But there was a crowd. um, In verse 25, we are introduced to a woman who has been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. Now Mark does not give us the nature of her hemorrhage, nor, but it is believed to be a constant discharge. According to Leviticus 15, 19 to 33, 
This would make her unclean. Anything she touched would be unclean. Anyone she touched would be unclean. And she would be isolated from the people. Mark does not deal with her type of blood hemorrhage. Neither does he deal with the impurity issues. So we're not really going to deal with those either today. But it says that this woman is not identified with the name. Now when Jarius went to uh, Jesus, his name was Jarius. But when this woman came, Mark gave her no name. He just identified her as a woman. In 26, we learned some things about this woman. Uh, number one, in those 12 years, she had been to all kinds of doctors and endured much. Now, endured much is not like when we go to the doctor, they punch here, punch there, give us a couple of pills and say, see you later. In that day, medical treatment was sometimes scrinious, sometimes it was uh, things out of the ordinary. Some of the treatments caused more pain than the treatment, than the disease itself. So she went through all this, she endured much, it said, and, but she was not helped by any of them. She had spent all she had on these doctors. Bottom line, she is sick and she is broke. She must, at, at one time, she must have been wealthy because only the wealthy could afford doctors. This woman, had heard about Jesus. Now, she had probably heard the other miracles he had performed. She had heard Jesus had healed the man with the unclean spirit. She had heard how Jesus healed those at Simon's house. She had heard how he healed the paralytic, how he had healed uh, the man with the demon, how Jesus had even stilled the storm. He told the storm to be still, and the storm just be still. So she had heard these things. And the woman concludes, on the basis of Jesus' reputation, that he could probably heal her. In Mark, allows us to look into this woman's mind. And she said in her mind, that if I could only touch his clothes, I would be healed. See, the woman faced many obstacles trying to get to Jesus. Because can't you see, she's in this crowd. She's weak. She's anemic. She's tired. She's in pain. She can barely walk for long periods of time. Can't you see her pushing her way to get to Jesus? Squeezing her way through the crowd. Getting pushed from side to side by others. Getting knocked down as she tries to get to Jesus. But can't you see her with her eyes fixed on Jesus? And her arms outstretched reaching. Just to touch Jesus' clothes somewhere. She also had a problem with her gender because she was a woman. And women were not to talk to men and women were not to touch men. And She was nameless. She was a nobody. She had her uncleanness to deal with and she had shame. She had to overcome social and ritual boundaries and to approach and even touch Jesus. She had to overcome many obstacles but her focus was still to get to Jesus. Have obstacles been put in your way in your attempt to follow Jesus? Verse 27 says that she came up behind Jesus in the crowd and touched his clothes. Luke says that she touched the hem of his garment. Now, in my mind, I imagine in order to touch the hem of his garment, she had to get down low. Because hymns are, you know, just like my hymn is real low. So hymns are low. So I would 
would imagine that she was on her knees, that she was crawling on her knees in order to get to Jesus through the crowd. And see, sometimes life knocks us to our knees. Sometimes we don't know what to do, but we, what, what we need to do is do like this woman did to seek Jesus. Verse 29 says, She immediately felt in her body that her hemorrhage had stopped and that she had been healed. See, her uncleanness did not defile Jesus, but Jesus' cleanness cleaned her. See, her suffering is over. And we must realize that it was not the power in the clothes that healed her, but it was the power was in her contact with Jesus. It was the saving power of her faith. It was the faith that saved her. Now the significance of the miracle required a confrontation between Jesus and the woman. Jesus, knowing that power had gone out of him, turned and said, Who touched me? Well, again, I want to imagine that the disciples said, as my prophetic five-year-old niece, that just daughter, granddaughter that just went out, when he asked, who touched me? I imagine the disciples said, duh. <laughs> see, see, you are in a crowd, Jesus. You got people all around you, Jesus. And you going to ask the question, who touched you? But you see, it said Jesus kept looking for her. It didn't say Jesus kept looking for somebody. It said Jesus kept looking for her. So Jesus already knew who it was. But the woman came forth with fear and trembling. She fell down on her knees before Jesus and she told him the whole story. She tells the whole truth out of respect. For she already knows that Jesus already knows. Fear led this woman to trust and faith. Jesus has forced her into a personal encounter of growth. It says fear and trembling is how should we should come before the divine. It said even the disciples tremble when Jesus steals the storm. In Philippians 2.12 it says to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Verse 34 says Jesus calls her daughter. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. Calling her daughter is often a respectful and affectionate address women to women regardless of their age and relations. But calling her daughter also suggested that Jesus now has a personal relationship with him and now that she is one of his family. Jesus gives her a statement of faith, a dismissal in peace, and a pronouncement that she is free of her affliction. Again, in that day, Jesus' actions would have been shocking because men were not to, not only were women not to touch men, men were not to talk to women, especially women who were considered unclean. The most striking feature in this woman was her determination to get to Jesus and her unshakable conviction that she would be healed by his cloak if she touched his cloak. The most impressive thing about Jesus was not his healing power, but that it was his sensitivity to others. So when all else fails, this woman sought Jesus. What we learn here is from this woman is that she heard of Jesus, she believed in Jesus, and she was saved. Now isn't that the same recipe for salvation? Because Romans 10, 9 and 10, 10 says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And it says, for with the heart, she believed in her heart, that for with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth 
she made the salvation, the confession unto salvation. But then Romans 10, 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now just as this woman had reached out to Jesus in 1983, I also had to look at, reach out to Jesus. See, I was 28 years old. I was diagnosed with a disease called nephrotic syndrome. And what that meant was my kidneys would not allow my body to hold protein. The doctor called me and gave me a frank talk. He said, this disease is incurable, and you may make it to age 30. Well, my life was filled with doctors and constant blood tests. I had a doctor for hypertension because my blood pressure was out of the roof. I had a nephrologist because my kidneys were going into failure. I had a hematologist because either the red blood cells were eating the white blood cells or the white blood cells were eating the red blood cells. I had a cancer doctor who administered chemotherapy. I had a new neurologist because I was having headaches. So see, I was going to all these doctors just as this woman did, but I was not getting any better. Finally, after they had done all they knew to do and I did all I knew to do, I was just sick and tired of being sick and tired. And see, I had read about a man in the Bible named Hezekiah, and he had given a short time to live, but he turned his face to the wall and God granted him 15 more years. So I said, well, if God did that for Hezekiah, he might can help me out. So I sought Jesus, and I literally, I don't know how Hezekiah turned his face to the wall, but I literally, in my bed, turned my face to the wall. And I did what you might call an unconventional prayer. Because I said, Lord, I turned this in my life over to you. Now, if it's your will that you heal me, then you heal me now. But if it's your will that I should die, just let that happen too. Just let me die now. And at that point, I start getting better. I start getting better. And as you can see, last month I celebrated my 64th birthday. Unlike this woman, she was healed instantly, but my healing has not come yet. I got better, and I lived a good life, but I was not healed. And in, 19, in 2010, I started on dialysis. For three days a week, four hours a day, I go on a dialysis machine. Even though a dialysis machine. Now see, even though I'm not healed down here, I still got hope. I do have hope for, I used to read Moses when he got to the promised land and he struck the rock instead of talking to the rock. And God told Moses after all he had done that he could not enter into the promised land. Before I found out the sovereignty of God, I used to get a little upset about that because I said, God, you might have to let him in. Just what's letting one little man in? But what God did, he didn't let him in, but he allowed him to look over and see the promised land. But what happened is when I turned to the New Testament, and there on the mountain of transfiguration, there was Elijah and there was Moses. So Moses did not make it to the promised land down here. But Moses made it after he crossed over. So God, through his word, just like Moses, he has allowed me to look over into that promised land. And you see, I see a land where I will have a glorified body. A land where there will not be dialysis machines and needles and doctors and nurses. I see a land 
where one day Jesus is going to tell me, Daughter, your faith has made you wait. Now, do you have an issue that is out of control? Are you in a place that you just don't know what to do? All I can advise you to do is seek Jesus. Thank you very much.